Welcome to Love Worth Finding with pastor, teacher, and author Adrian Rogers. Reaching out with God's love, bringing people to Christ, touching lives around the world, and helping you find the answers you need today. Join us as we prepare to open God's Word and discover how your life can be changed forever by His great love worth finding. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 27, and look in one verse here in just a moment, verse 22. The background is this. Jesus is on trial before Pilate. He's standing before Pilate. One of these days, Pilate will stand before Jesus. Pilate has Jesus on his hands. Uh, Shall he allow Jesus to be exonerated or executed? Uh, Commended? crucified. And Pilate is a fence-straddling politician, and whatever buttered his own bread would determine his conduct. But he asked a question. Look at it in verse 22. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all say unto him, Let him be crucified. Now I ask you the same question. Because as Jesus Christ was before Pilate, Jesus Christ is now today before you. And this question, therefore, coming to you this morning, and I want you to listen to it carefully. What are you going to do with Jesus? It is a personal question. I'm not asking what somebody else is going to do with Jesus. I am asking you today, what will you do with Jesus? It's a personal question. And it is a present question. I'm not asking what you will do later on or what you may have done. I'm asking you right now, today, presently, what will you do with Jesus? And furthermore, it's a pressing question. I can tell you that you will do something with him. You say, no, I won't. Oh, yes, you will. (laughs) You will do something with him. You will accept him or reject him. You will crown him or crucify him. You will hear him or ignore him, but you will do something with Jesus Christ. It is a pressing question. But here's the thing I really want to put upon your heart. It is a pertinent question. I'm not asking what you're going to do uh, with some social event. I'm not asking what you're going to do with some political personality. I'm not asking what you're going to do with some idea. I'm asking, what will you do with Jesus, who is called Christ? That's a pertinent question. Who is Jesus Christ? Let's discuss him. I believe, and the Bible teaches, that Jesus Christ is God. Now, don't miss that. I'm asking, what will you do with Jesus? Jesus is God. Now, if Jesus is not God... I want to say that Jesus Christ is an imposter. If Jesus Christ is not God, he is an impersonator. If Jesus Christ is not God, he is an imitator. If Jesus Christ is not God, he is a pretender. Because I'm going to show you from the Word of God, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that Jesus Christ himself claimed to be God the Son and the Son of God. Now, you can't therefore just tip your hat to Jesus and say Jesus was a good man or Jesus was a prophet. Oh, no. If Jesus Christ is not God, he is a fake, a fraud, an imposter, a deceiver. Now, uh, not only that, but he has deceived countless millions. He has blasphemed the Almighty. He has desecrated all that is sacred. He has falsely represented God the Father. He has scandalized the truth of God. And he has invalidated the writing of the prophets if he is not God. Don't just come along and tip the hat to Jesus. (laughs) Oh, no. Either you accept him and bow the knee or you reject him. What will you do? with Jesus. 
One man wrote some high-sounding words, and they sound good, but I want you to listen to them carefully. He said, if Jesus Christ is a man, and only a man, I say, that of all mankind I will cleave to him, and cleave to him all way. If Jesus Christ is a God, and the only God, I swear, I will follow him through heaven and hell, the earth, the sea, and the air. Now that sounds good. But friend, if Jesus Christ is a man and only a man, he is a deceiver, a fake, a fraud, an imposter. He is one of three things, Lord, liar, or lunatic. Deity, deceiver, or demented. He's one of the three. And you're going to have to take your pick of those three this morning. And I'm asking you this question again. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Now, I said at the beginning that Jesus Christ is God. And I want to give you four lines of evidence that show the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not incidental. This is the fundamental doctrine of our faith, the deity, the Godhood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to get the four reasons that we believe that Jesus is God. Number one. All of the attributes of God the Father are found in the Lord Jesus. All of the attributes of God the Father are found in the Lord Jesus. Now, I was, uh, I was in my front yard and a couple came up to me, or a man came up to me rather, with a briefcase, to talk with me about religious things. And uh, so I said, well, I'll be happy to talk with you. I said, uh, what group do you represent? He said, well, I just want to talk about the Bible. I said, well, everybody has some affinity group. Uh, where do you worship? He said, well, that's, that's incidental. I just want to uh, talk with you. I said, no, I'd just like to know where you're coming from. I already knew, but I said, I'd just like to find out where you're coming from. I, I said, uh, what do you call yourself? Well, he said, all right, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. Does that bother you? I said, not at all. So am I. He said, you are? I said, yes. By the way, I believe that Jesus is Jehovah. He said, oh, no. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, Jesus is Jehovah. And I want to share some scriptures. Now, when I say Jehovah, Jehovah is the name for God in the Old Testament. It is used some 7,000 times. In your King James Version of the scripture, which I'm preaching from, that word Jehovah is translated Lord, L-O-R-D. When pious Jews were translating, uh, not translating, but transcribing the scriptures, they would never ever even pronounce that name audibly. When they came to that name, they would just bow their head, shut their eyes, and worship. When they would write the name in the scripture, they would lay aside the old pen, and get a brand new pen just to write that name, Jehovah. Jehovah. Now, it was the personal name that God used when he was dealing with his people. It speaks of a covenant-keeping God whose name is Jehovah. What I propose to show you today, and I want you to listen carefully, that the Jehovah of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New Testament are one and the same. I want to give you some scripture. Take your pen. You won't have time to turn to these, so I suggest that you jot them down as I have. First of all, Isaiah 40 and verse 3. Here's a prophecy concerning our Lord. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Now that is the word Jehovah. Prepare ye the way of Jehovah and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Who is he talking about? Jehovah, our God. Now see how this is fulfilled in the New Testament. Look in Matthew 3, verse 3. Don't turn to it. Jot it down. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist, John the Baptist, saying of Jesus, 
Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. John was speaking of Jesus. Isaiah was speaking of Jehovah. And the same scripture is used. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled this scripture. Well, let me give you another comparison. Isaiah 43, verse 11. God speaks of himself, and here's what he says. I, even I, am the Lord. That's the word Jehovah. I, even I, am Jehovah. Now, listen to this carefully. And beside me there is no Savior. There is no Savior other than Jehovah. Do you have that? That's plain. Isaiah 43, verse 11. But now listen to Titus 2, verse 13. The Bible says we're to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hello? Listen. God says, I am Jehovah, there is no other Savior. And then we read in Titus, we're to be looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? That the Jesus of the New Testament is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Let me give you another uh, couplet of verses. Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith Jehovah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Now Jehovah, the King of Israel, says, I am the first and the last. Then in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17, John the apostle has a vision of Jesus and he says, And when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead, and he, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. In the Old Testament, Jehovah says, I am the first and the last. In the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. David alone, out guiding his sheep, under divine inspiration, picked up his harp and began to sing in Psalm 23 and verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And actually uses the word again, Jehovah. Jehovah is my shepherd. What did Jesus say in John chapter 10 verse 11? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus is the Jehovah of the Old Testament. The shepherd God of the Old Testament is the shepherd Savior of the New Testament. Psalm 24 and verse 10. I love this. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. The Jehovah of hosts. He is the King of glory. But then what did the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 8? He speaks of the deity of our Lord, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified, listen, the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory. Psalm 24, 10, who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. 1 Corinthians 2, 8, Jesus is the Lord of glory. Let me give you one more in time. Would, we could go on and on comparing the Jesus of the new with the Yahweh or Jehovah of the Old Testament. Exodus 20, verses 10 and 11, speaking of the Sabbath. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in it is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, it is the Sabbath of Jehovah. But in Matthew 12, verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. So I'm just, what I'm trying to so, show you folks, are you listening? When you are witnessing for Jesus, you are Jehovah's witness. <laughs> the Jehovah of the Old Testament and the Jesus of the New Testament are one. Now, I'm, I've just used the scriptures. You see, you need to understand the pre-existence of Jesus. Jesus did not have his beginning at Bethlehem. There never was a time when the Lord Jesus was not. 
Put this scripture down, John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the word. It's the Greek word logos. In the beginning was the logos. And the word was with God. And the word, the logos, was God. Jesus is called the word of God. And this scripture says, he was in the beginning with the Father. And he was God. When he was born at Bethlehem, he was as old as his father and older than his mother. <laughs> when he was born, there never was a time when he was not. Jesus always has been. You say, well, Pastor Rogers, I don't understand that. Well, that doesn't bother me that you don't understand it. Now, you can't understand God. Can the finite understand the infinite? I understand that uh, Albert Einstein came up with the theory of relativity. It's so complicated that only... Twelve men can understand the theory of relativity. I can't vouch for that because I've never met the other eleven. But <laughs> that, that's that complicated. Somebody asked Mrs. Einstein one time, do you understand the theory of relativity? She said, no, but I understand Dr. Einstein. She knew him. She knew him. Listen, I cannot understand the preexistence of Jesus, but I believe it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Listen, the absolute holiness of Jesus Christ is taught. And there's only one who is absolutely holy, and that is God himself. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 9. God says, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. I am God and not man. There's no man. That is inherently holy. Only God. But Jesus Christ, John 8, verse 46, could look at his detractors, his enemies, those who were sniping at him, and he could say, which of you convinceth me of sin? I wouldn't ask that to my friends, much less my enemies. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And the apostles, when they talked about the crucifixion of Jesus, said in Acts 3, verse 14, but ye denied the Holy One and the just. His absolute pristine holiness sets him apart from all other individuals. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible, Jesus never once prayed for forgiveness? Think about it. He never once prayed for forgiveness. He taught us to pray and forgive us our debts as we uh, forgive those who sin against us, our debtors. He never, either that was consummate arrogance or he was indeed absolutely holy. So what have I talked about? First of all, we're just giving you some lines of, of, of evidence of his, of his deity and we're talking about his attributes. But secondly, let me give you another reason that I believe that Jesus is God. Now don't miss this. Folks, this is not incidental. Uh, the adoration that he received shows him to be God. Jesus received adoration. Now listen to me. Jesus allowed himself to be worshipped. Now, idolatry is the ultimate sin. To worship any other God other than Yahweh, Jehovah. And yet Jesus allowed himself uh, to be worshipped. Jesus himself knew that only God is to be worshipped. Now, don't miss this point. Satan tried to get Jesus to worship himself, Satan. Satan said to Jesus, I'll give you the kingdoms of this world. If you will bow down and worship me, put this verse down. Luke chapter 4 and verse 8. Hear what Jesus Christ himself said. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Worship is reserved for God Almighty only. Now, Jesus allowed himself to be worshipped. Matthew 28 and verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. The same one who said that God and God only is to be worshipped. And here he is allowing his disciples to worship him. Suppose I were to come over here and bow down in front of Mark and start worshiping Mark. Mark, what would you do? I'll tell you what you'd do. You'd say, Pastor, stop. 
you don't, we'll both be in trouble. You for doing it, and I will be in trouble for allowing it. Look in Revelation chapter 22. You might turn to this one. John is on the island of Patmos. He's getting a vision from an angel. And the angel is showing John all of these wonderful things. And John is just overwhelmed. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I, heard, when I had heard and seen, now watch this, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he to me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Here's an angel saying, Don't you worship me. John, get up. I'm just a fellow servant. Worship God, worship God, worship God. Now, friend, listen. If Jesus allowed himself to be worshipped when he himself said that God alone is to be worshipped, either he is guilty of ultimate arrogance and inculcating the most despicable sin of idolatry, or else he is God. There's no two ways about it. No two ways about it. The adoration that Jesus has received shows him to be God. We've talked about his attributes. We've talked about his adoration. Let's talk about his own admission. Here's the third reason. Jesus is shown to be God by his own admission. An interesting thing. Jesus is having a discussion with the Pharisees. Uh, they could not accept the fact that he was God in flesh. And so in John chapter 8, verse 56, jot it down. You can look these up later, but we've got a lot of scripture to cover. Jesus said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. <laughs> now, Abraham had been dead for uh, centuries. And Jesus said, look, your father Abraham, the one that you adore, he rejoiced to see my day. Verse 57, then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? And now watch verse 58. Now, if you, don't, if you don't hear anything else in this message this morning, I want you to get this. This is John chapter 8 and verse 58. Jesus saith unto them, verily, verily. Now listen, when Jesus says verily, you pay attention. When he says verily, verily, you better pay attention. Verily, verily. This, he is saying it for emphasis. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now listen. Before Abraham was, I am. Don't miss this. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He didn't say I got here first. <laughs> he is saying before Abraham was, I am. And when he said that, look in verse 59, then took they up stones to cast at him. They're ready to stone him now because he said before Abraham was, I am. Why were they, why did they want to stone him? Because he said he was, I am. You see, listen, God called Moses to lead the Jews out of Egypt into the promised land. And Moses said, well, who shall I say sent me? Now, you have to understand that the Egyptians worshiped 2,200 different gods, 2,200 gods, and, uh, and uh, so Moses has to go and say, Which, who, who is the true God? Who shall I say sent me? Put this down in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. You want to know my credentials? The I am sent me. Not I was, not I will be, but I am. There never was a time when he was not. There never will be a time when he will not be. He is the great preexistent eternal God. This sacred name for God, the I am, the I am, the I am. And Jesus said unto them, they said, why are you, you haven't seen Abraham. You're not even 50 years old. He said, look, before Abraham ever got here, I am, I am. I'm telling you, folks, that the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. He himself claimed to be. 
Jesus said to Philip, listen, John 14, verses 8 and 9, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? I suppose you said to me, Adrian, show me the President of the United States. I said, well, you're looking at him. You've seen me, you've seen the President. You'd say, Mark, you hold him, Jim, you go get the butterfly net. I mean, the, the unmitigated arrogance for him to say, Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Not somebody like the Father. You have seen the Father by his own admission. Last point. Lastly, but not immediately. He is shown to be God by his abilities, by his abilities, his mighty abilities. I want to just mention three times in the Bible where the Bible mentions his ability, what he is able to do. First of all, he, because he is God, is able to save. Remember over there in Isaiah, Jehovah said, beside me there is no Savior. But put down Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, which says, Wherefore he, Jesus, is able to save unto the uttermost them that come unto God by him. I want to tell you today, he's able to save you. There's no one that he's not able to save. Anybody who wants to be saved can be saved. You say, well, have I committed the unpardonable sin? Friend, if you want to be saved, you can be saved. Anybody who wants to be saved hasn't committed the unpardonable sin. You say, am I one of the elect? If you want to be saved, just come on. Oh, who, who, who are the elect? I can put it, I, I, I can put that in 15 seconds. The elect or the whosoever wills. Whosoever will may come. He is able to save unto the uttermost them that come unto God by him. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. He's able to save. Not only is he able to save, but he's able to subdue. Philippians 3 verse 21 speaks of our Lord who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Friend, one of these days he's going to make you like himself. He's able to subdue all things, every dust, every speck of dust, every mountain, every celestial body must obey his will. He is able to save. He's able to subdue. And furthermore, he's able to secure. He's able to keep you saved. 2 Timothy 1.12. Paul says, for which cause I also suffer these things. Paul had been beaten, put in prison. He says, I suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He is able. He is able. What a mighty God we serve. Every need that you have, he's able to supply. A missionary was going to the foreign field, and just as the missionary was getting on the ship, a man handed the missionary an envelope, a sealed envelope. He said, put this in your pocket. Keep it with you. And if any time overseas you ever come to a place where you don't know where to turn or what to do, open this envelope. The missionary came home after having spent a lifetime on the foreign field. And he came home to give his report to his church, and he told about the trials and the temptations and the persecution and all of the perplexities. Then he reached in his pocket and pulled out that envelope, never opened, never opened. Thank God. Thank God, friend. 
There never comes to the child of God a time where he does not have a Savior that he can come to and cling to, and he is able. Do you believe that? I hope you do. Oh, what a mighty Savior we have. I love him with all of my heart. To explain him is impossible. To ignore him is disastrous. To reject him is fatal. What a mighty God. Human speech is too limited to describe him. Your human mind is too finite to comprehend him. The human heart is too small to contain him. Jesus Christ is God. Now I come back to our text. What shall I do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? You can crown him or crucify him. They said, let him be crucified. You can accept him or reject him. You can love him or despise him. You can believe him or ignore him, but you cannot be neutral. Pilate tried that, but he could not be neutral. Jesus is in your hands today. You must do the right thing because you need him in life. Amen. In life. If there were no heaven and no hell, you need Jesus day by day. Amen. He, is, he is like blood to your body, air to your lungs. You need him in life. You need him in death. You're going to die. You need him in death. You need him at the judgment. You will stand before God one day to be judged. What will you say then? God, have mercy on me. I didn't have a chance. He'll show you this scene today. What will you say? God, I didn't, I didn't understand. He'll replay the message today. Friend, every excuse that you have, will falter and fail. Right now, Jesus is in your hands, but at the judgment, you'll be in his hands. I ask you again this question. It is a personal question. It's a present question. It is a pressing question. It is a pertinent question. What will you do with Jesus? Would you accept him as your Lord and Savior? If you will, I promise you on the authority of the Word of God, he will forgive every sin. Secondly, he will come into you to give you strength and power as, as he's done to me for over half a century. Thirdly, he'll use you as his instrument, live his life through you. Fourthly, when you die or when he comes, he'll take you straight to heaven, I promise, on the authority of the word of God. Bow your heads in prayer. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're not certain that you're saved today, let's get it settled. You can know for certain today that you're saved by receiving Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, I'm not talking to you about becoming a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian or something like that. I'm not talking to you about just turning over a new leaf and trying to do better, to live a good life. I'm talking about receiving Jesus Christ by faith into your heart. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And that word believe means trust. Would you pray this prayer, dear Lord Jesus? I believe you're the Son of God and God the Son. I believe you paid for my sin with your blood on the cross. I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I now by faith accept the gift of salvation. I take the hand of faith and receive the gift of salvation. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Save me, Jesus. Pray that prayer. Save me, Jesus. Did you ask him? Did you? All right, by an act of faith, pray this. Thank you for doing it. I receive it by faith according to your promise, and that settles it. I don't ask for a sign. I don't look for feeling. I stand on your word. I trust you and you only.
thank you for saving me. Now give me the courage to make it public. Help me not to be ashamed of you. And begin now to make me the person you want me to be. In your name I pray. Amen. We pray God has blessed you as you've watched this message. If you'd like additional copies or information on other resources, write us at Love Worth Finding, P.O. Box 38800, Memphis, Tennessee, 38183.